So this is a video that I've put together entitled The Jupiter Effect. A marvellous picture of uh, the planet Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. And the title comes from a book. This one, The Jupiter Effect by uh, John Gribben. And even with a foreword by Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer. John Gribben was a very famous uh, author that used to write for the New Scientist magazine and produced quite a lot of very good books uh, in his time. Um, but in 1974, he published this book predicting that the planets in the solar system were all going to line up and trigger a devastating series of catastrophes on the Earth as a result of their gravity all pulling in one direction at the same time. The book sold very well. It became a huge bestseller. Now, it predicted, as these things do, that disaster was just eight years away. And I think that's about right for predicting a disaster. You don't want it to be too nearby because otherwise your um, prediction turns out to be false rather quickly and the sales of your book will come to an end. Uh, but if it's too far into the future, no one will care. So the Jupiter effect was basically that uh, the sun and all of the planets were going to be aligned in a grand parade. And this really didn't happen very often. And it was stated that it was the first time in 179 years that this was going to be the case. Now, this begs the question immediately, why wasn't there a series of catastrophic disasters 179 years before 1982? But I don't really think it um, bothers to talk about that. And here's a colour image illustrating the same idea that the planets would all be aligned and that the gravity would create super strong tides and that would lead to earthquakes. The tides um, on Earth not only cause the oceans to rise and fall, but there's a corresponding stress in the rocks. And so the, the land surface also does move and that could indeed be just enough to trigger an earthquake. People have often associated actually that the earthquakes tend to be occurring at full moon when the uh, moon's gravity is aligned pulling upwards on the local area. Um, I'm not sure about that, but uh, that's been stated by some people. So let's just uh, consider how the tides actually work. And the popular view is illustrated in this picture, which is that uh, the bulge of water is pulled by the gravitational effect of the moon. And then the Earth spins underneath this bulge. And so different portions of the Earth experience high tide when they're pointing towards the moon and low tide when they're pointing at right angles to it. And then it explains the fact that there are two tides a day by saying there's a corresponding bulge on the other side of the moon um, due to centrifugal force. Now, actually, that's wrong because there is no such force as centrifugal force as such. Um, it's, a, it's a fictitious idea that there is a, a centrifugal force, um, but it is often talked about as a shorthand uh, form for what's going on. What's really happening, if you'll bear with me, is that the water on the earth is being pulled so that if you imagine a, some water that's along the equatorial, uh, or, or along, along the meridian line here, in the direction of the moon, that is being pulled towards the moon and only in that horizontal direction. Whereas water at this side here is being pulled down and across towards the moon. And from here, it's being pulled up and across towards the moon. Now, all of the across motion makes it move on this diagram from right to left. Uh, sorry, from left to right, as you're looking at it, uh, from here this way, all the way across. But there's also a component of that motion, of that force pulling in the downward direction. In other words, the, the force vector from this region here it is angled downward slightly towards the moon in a 
very long thin triangle but nevertheless it's made of two components one that goes sideways and one that comes down and here it's one that goes sideways and one in the up direction and so the water is pulled up from the bottom half of the earth and down from the top half of the earth on this diagram creating this bulge as it all tries to flow into the equatorial line caused by those force components and it also explains what happens on the far side over here consider some water at this location this is being pulled towards the moon again in a direction that is not parallel to the uh, straight line but has a component downwards towards that straight line and a component laterally and so this water tries to flow this way but the earth's in the way but it can flow downwards towards the equator and likewise the water at this position is attracted in a long thin triangle towards the moon that has a component upwards to the center line on this diagram and so the water here all, all along this region and this region all flows towards the center point and builds up into a bulge so it's actually that's the reason for the tides of course it's all made more complicated by the fact that the sun and the moon both create tides on the earth the sun is 400 times further away uh, but 400 times larger well it's not 400 times as massive but it is much more massive than the moon um, and the result is that the gravity effect of uh, these objects is more or less similar it's about 60 percent moon and 40 percent sun that causes the tides and so we get very strong tides when the three bodies are in a straight line when they're at right angles the tidal effects partially cancel out and we get the very weak neap tides so that's really what's going on with tides and it's important to understand that um, if you're going to consider what happens with the uh, this supposed jupiter effect the alignment of the planets so let's just have a look at some numbers your weight caused by the earth's gravity with the earth being very near um, is of the order of 70 kilograms some are more some are less but the effect of the gravity of the other objects pulling on you is tiny. I mean really tiny. The effect pulling to you towards the sun, the effect of the sun's gravity on your body is the equivalent of the weight on earth of 40 grams. Now that, is, that compared to 70 kilograms, I could do this in force units in terms of newtons, uh, maybe 700 newtons and four, uh, uh, 0.04 of a, of a newton but nevertheless it, it's a very tiny amount so the sun doesn't tend to lift you very much up off the ground as it goes over your head during the day but there is a tiny effect it's even tinier for the moon in fact it lifts your weight by two grams you can see that isn't really uh, going to do very much and that's why that explanation about the tides needs to be uh, put in perspective. Now, Jupiter might be a very massive planet, uh, but it's also further away than the sun um, and only one tenth of a percent of the sun's mass. Um, and so when you do the mathematics, uh, the uh, effect that Jupiter can cause is actually one one hundredth as strong as that of the moon because the moon is very nearby um, and the inverse square law diminishes the effect of Jupiter very dramatically and Mars small planet long way away uh, compared to the moon well 0.05 micrograms it's really the square root of nothing and so actually 1982 came and the effect didn't cause any major catastrophes or earthquakes um, and it was calculated that in fact because of the uh, alignment the high tide would indeed be higher than usual by a paltry 0.04 millimeters uh, so almost immeasurable compared to the you know the size of even the tiniest waves I would defy anybody to actually really be able to measure that so why 
didn't it work? What was what was this all going on then? Well, the story about the alignment, first of all, goes back to the fact that there was a rough alignment of the planets, and it did indeed occur every 179 years. But really, it was only the outer planets that were so aligned, and they were in the order uh, shown here with the directions spread over 95 degrees compared to the Earth. So that alignment really isn't very good. It's more than a right angle to uh, Mercury or Neptune. The other planets are a little bit more concentrated. And you've got Jupiter and Pluto more or less in the same direction. Venus, Mars and Saturn more or less in the same direction. But really, the alignment's not brilliant. Um, so what was it all about? Well, the Voyager spacecraft were being sent out to do the grand tour of the outer solar system, Jupiter, then Saturn, and in the case of Voyager 2, on to Uranus and Neptune. And they were only able to do that because the planets were going to be in just the right place. Um, and that only happened every 179 years to allow such a, a trajectory to visit all four of them in one go. And the path taken was very much a spiral that went to Jupiter and then picked up a slingshot of gravity from around the back of Jupiter, accelerating the spacecraft onto Saturn, picking up another slingshot and spiraling it round towards Uranus and then on to Neptune in the case of Voyager 2. And that uh, series of gravitational slingshots uh, was only going to be possible in a fairly short uh, time window while the planets were in the right place. And you have to bear in mind, of course, it would take some time to launch from Earth and get to Jupiter, and then Saturn will have moved by then and the others will have moved. So the alignment was one in terms of timing as well as the actual position, and all of that had to be calculated. And it was realised that this possibility existed by an engineer at NASA who suggested the idea and there was a bit of a rush to get the Voyager probes designed, ready and launched in time for this uh, particular grand tour to be possible before the alignment uh, became um, impractical again. Anyway, the, uh, John Gribbin published another book after the non-appearance of the uh, disaster in 1982, uh, The Jupiter Effect Reconsidered. And uh, this said, ah, actually, when we said there were going to be tidal effects and that this alignment was going to cause effects uh, by the gravity acting on the Earth, what we really meant was the gravitational effects were going to affect the sun and uh, pull the layers of the sun into a distorted shape, which would cause outbreaks of sunspots and solar flares and mass ejections from the sun and a great increase in the overall solar wind and that the solar wind would then have its effects on the earth vastly increasing the number of aurora the northern and southern lights the aurora australis and the aurora borealis and that this would change the weather patterns and the weather patterns could uh, create such unusually strong winds that even the uh, they would change the rotation rate of the earth well this is uh, uh, all very well but unfortunately we can again do the mathematics and work out that the tidal effect of the planets on the sun uh, is pretty small and the largest slice of it is jupiter at 12 units Saturn adds a further one, the Earth one, Venus 1 1.6 because it's a bit closer, and all of the rest add almost nothing to it. And so really the tidal effect is mostly down to Jupiter and the rough alignment of the other planets will hardly change the total. The fundamental fact is that the Sun is well over 99% of the uh, total mass of the solar system. In fact, Jupiter is just 0.1% of the mass of the Sun, and it itself is then two and a half times the mass of all the other planets put together. And so really, 
the effect of these is very tiny indeed and uh, the whole story was really uh, just uh, not credible. But finally, I particularly liked the way that uh, Sir Patrick Moore had a go um, at getting involved in this saga and uh, poking some fun in the direction of this, uh, this book. What happened was that on April Fool's Day, the 1st of April, 1976, um, Sir Patrick went on the radio and announced that there was going to be a planetary alignment that was going to decrease the effect of gravity on the Earth. He was interviewed on the radio and said that at exactly 9.47 a.m., Pluto would pass behind Jupiter and that this alignment would create a combination gravity force that would make people on the Earth feel less weight. He suggested that, that it would be called the Jovian Plutonian gravitational effect, clearly uh, pointing fun at the Jupiter effect. And he said that the listeners should experience the phenomenon by trying to jump up in the air. And they, he promised that they would experience a strange floating sensation as the gravity would temporarily be diminished. Now, of course, Pluto is even smaller than our moon and a right on the edge of the main part of our solar system so far away that it couldn't possibly have any influence and even if it did the alignment changes so slowly uh, as these outer planets and uh, the place the case of pluto takes 250 odd years to rotate around the sun and jupiter 12 years so the chart the timing at exactly 947 would well, the alignment would be almost the same at midday, wouldn't it? They, they, it's going to change very, very slowly indeed. Clearly, he was having a bit of fun with this. Well, at 9.47, he announced, jump now. And dozens of people phoned into the radio show reporting success. A Dutch woman claimed she and her husband had floated around the room together. Another claimed that she and 11 friends, including the table they had been sat around, began to ascend up towards the ceiling. But not everyone was happy. One angry caller phoned in and complained he jumped and hit his head on the ceiling and demanded compensation. And actually, this became, uh, at least in astronomical circles, one of the most celebrated April Fool's Day hoaxes of the late 20th century. Now, to give him his due, John Gribbin finally in 1999 said about the Jupiter effect, quote, I'm sorry I had anything to do with it. And uh, I think that's uh, very magnanimous of him. I suspect he made quite a lot of money selling quite a lot of books. Uh, but as long as people treated it all in fun, I don't really have a problem with that. Anyway, that's the Jupiter effect story.